Hello and welcome. The Setting Apart podcast is a pit stop where you can get nourished, encouraged, and refreshed whenever you need a break. I am your host, IP, and every episode I get to share my stories, my outlook, my reflections on all things inspired through the lens of faith. So grab yourself a coffee, sit back, relax, and chill. Last episode, I've gained some insights on angels. Angels are non corporeal spirits created by God to serve and help God. One of the ways they serve God is by serving man, to be messenger of God on the one hand, and to bring our prayers to God's attention and intercede for us. Again, we, the readers, know Raphael is an angel, but none of the characters from the story knows his true identity yet. In this episode, we see Raphael, the archangel, in action. A large fish tries to swallow Tobias' feet, but was killed and eaten. In addition, certain parts of the fish has medicinal functions, while others can be used to drive demons away from the bodies they afflicted. Then, Raphael, the archangel, became a matchmaker, telling Tobiah that he will be marrying Gabriel's daughter, Sarah. But... Tobiah heard about the fate of the seven suitors of Sarah. All were killed by a demon before she could be married to them. So Raphael reassured Tobiah not to worry, for Sarah is to be his wife, and shared with him how to get rid of the demon. Then I came across chapter 6, verse 18, which reads, Then, when you are about to have intercourse with her, both of you must first get up to pray, unquote. Hmm, what is that all about? I mean, I know Catholics are spiritual, but to get up and pray before having sex? Never heard of that one before. But wait, there's more. Continuing the same verse 18, Raphael reiterated, Do not be afraid, for she was set apart for you before the world existed. Unquote. Again, What is that all about? Predestination of soulmates? Well, we shall unpack these and more in this episode. Season 2, Episode 7, Soulmate, Marriage, and Spirituality. The Bible I'm reading from is the New American Bible or the NAB online version taken from the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops or the USCCB website. I will leave a link in the show note on my website for your reference. The URL for my website is www.settingapart.com. Setting apart is one word. I invite you to read along Tobit chapter 6 with me. If you do not have a Bible handy, feel free to check out the Setting Apart channel on YouTube where I have uploaded the subtitles for all the episodes in this season there. I will also leave the YouTube link together with all references and sources used or coded in the show note on my website. Let us pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to gather in your name, to listen attentively to you. As it is written, as your word unfolds, it gives light. Even the simple understand. We pray that the Holy Spirit in our midst could guide us in opening our ears and our heart to be enlightened by your word. Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Tobit, chapter 6 When the young man left home, accompanied by the angel, the dog followed Tobiah out and went along with them. Both journeyed along, and when the first night came, they camped beside the Tigris River. When the young man went down to wash his feet in the Tigris River, a large fish leaped out of the water and tried to swallow his foot. He shouted in alarm. But the angel said to the young man, Grab the fish and hold on to it. He seized the fish and hauled it up on dry land. The angel then told him, Slit the fish open 
and take out its gall, heart, and liver, and keep them with you, but throw away the other entrails. Its gall, heart, and liver are useful for medicine. After Tobiah had slit the fish open, he put aside the gall, heart, and liver. Then he roasted and ate part of the fish. The rest he salted and kept for the journey. Afterward, the two of them traveled on together till they drew near to Media. Then the young man asked the angel this question. Brother Azariah, what medicine is in the fish's heart, liver, and gall? He answered, As for the fish's heart and liver, if you burn them to make smoke in the presence of a man or a woman who is afflicted by a demon or evil spirit, any affliction will flee and never return. As for the gall, if you apply it to the eyes of one who has white scales, blowing right into them, sight will be restored. When they had entered Media and were getting close to Agbertana, Raphael said to the young man, Brother Tobiah, he answered, Here I am. Raphael continued, Tonight we must stay in the house of Raguel, who is a relative of yours. He has a beautiful daughter named Sarah but no other son or daughter apart from Sarah. Since you are Sarah's closest relative, you more than any other have the right to marry her. Moreover, her father's estate is rightfully yours to inherit. The girl is wise, courageous, and very beautiful. And her father is a good man who loves her dearly. He continued, You have the right to marry her. So listen to me, brother. Tonight, I will speak to her father about the girl so that we may take her as your bride. When we return from Rogers, we will have the wedding feast for her. I know that Raguel cannot keep her from you or promise her to another man. He will incur the death penalty as decreed in the book of Moses. For he knows that you, more than anyone else, have the right to marry his daughter. Now listen to me, brother. We will speak about this girl tonight, so that we may arrange her engagement to you. Then, when we return from Rogers, we will take her and bring her back with us to your house. But Tobiah said to Raphael in reply, Brother Azariah, I have heard that she has already been given in marriage to seven husbands and that they have died in the bridal chamber. On the very night they approach her, they would die. I have also heard it said that it was a demon that killed them. So now I too am afraid of this demon because it is in love with her and does not harm her, but it kills any man who wishes to come close to her. I am my father's only child. If I should die, I would bring the life of my father and mother down to their grave in sorrow over me. They have no other son to bury them. Raphael said to him, Do you not remember your father's commands? He ordered you to marry a woman from your own ancestral family. Now listen to me, brother. Do not worry about that demon. Take Sarah. I know that tonight she will be given to you as your wife. When you go into the bridal chamber, take some of the fish's liver and the heart and place them on the embers intended for incense and an odor will be given off. As soon as the demon smells the odor, it will flee and never again show itself near her. Then, when you are about to have intercourse with her, both of you must first get up to pray. Beg the Lord of heaven that mercy and protection be granted you. 
Do not be afraid, for she was set apart for you before the world existed. You will save her, and she will go with you. And I assume that you will have children by her, and they will be like brothers for you. So do not worry. When Tobiah heard Raphael's words that she was his kinswoman and of the lineage of his ancestral house, he loved her deeply, and his heart was truly set on her. Wow, there is so much going on here. Let's see how much we can squeeze in today. I shall begin with the commentary from St. Bede, the Venerable on the Book of Tobit. Now, St. Bede is one of the last Western Christian scholars declared as Doctor of the Church. According to Bede, the Book of Tobit is understood best when it is not interpreted as a history, but as an allegory of the mysteries of Christ and the Church. Now, as a refresher from paragraph 115 of the CCC, and he reads, According to an ancient tradition, one can distinguish between two senses of Scripture, the literal and the spiritual, the latter being subdivided into the allegorical, moral, and anagogical senses. The profound concordance of the four senses guarantees all its richness to the living reading of Scripture in the Church. Unquote. St. Augustine, another doctor of the Church, describes the four ways on how to interpret and teach the Scriptures in his four books of On Christian Doctrine in the first century. And I quote, The letter speaks of deeds, allegory to faith, the moral, how to act, anagogy, our destiny. Now, the literal teaches what God and our ancestors did. The allegory is where our faith and belief is hid. The moral meaning gives us the rule of daily life, that is, our instructions on how to live. The anagogy shows us where we end our strife, leading us to our destination. Now, zooming in on the allegorical, according to paragraph 117 of the CCC, here's what it says. The allegorical sense is that we can acquire a more profound understanding of events by recognizing their significance in Christ. Thus, the crossing of the Red Sea is a sign or a type of Christ's victory and also of Christian baptism. For example, Jesus is the new Moses. It is a typology pointing um, the significance of Moses in Jesus Christ. That which is not achieved in Moses is achieved and fulfilled in Christ. Now, Bede also subdivided the sixth age of salvation history into three stages. God's mercy is extended during the first stage to a small remnant Christ-believing Jews, and during the second stage, that mercy is extended to the full number of Gentiles, and during the third, to the full number of Jews. We can see that in Romans chapter 11. In other words, God's mercy is first given to a small number of Jewish believers. The majority with the hardened heart rejected Christ. God's mercy is then given to the Gentiles next in the second stage and back to all the Jews and to all nations in the third and final stage of the sixth age of salvation history. Now, there are six or seven ages of salvation history. You may wish to find out what periods they correspond to. Of special interest to Bede in that history are the salvation of Jews and Jewish-Gentile relations. For Bede, Tobit represents the Jews in two aspects, one good, one bad. Insofar as Tobit is portrayed as a man of good works in chapter 1, Bede sees him favorably as an allegory either for the people of Israel or for Israel's teachers of old. On the other hand, when Tobit was blinded, Bede views him more unfavorably as an allegory for the great majority of Jews who now, during the second stage, are so blinded by pride that they refuse to receive God's revelation in Christ. By contrast, 
the younger Tobiah, represents Christ's humanity, while the angel Raphael, who journeys and counsels Tobiah, represents Christ's divinity. In the same way that Christ first comes to save the Gentiles, and then, at the last, to save the Jews, so too do Tobiah and Raphael go first to exorcise the demons from Sarah, who represents the Gentiles, and then to restore sight to Tobit, who represents the Jews. Notice that in this chapter, and in fact, throughout the book, Tobiah is cooperating everything that Raphael asks of him. Raphael calls the young man, and Tobiah replied, Here I am. We see that in verse 11. It is the response of someone willing to listen and ready to act on command. Tobiah is obedient not only to Tobit, his father, but also cooperates fully with Raphael, the angel. And so today, are we cooperating with the promptings from the Holy Spirit, from the angels sent to us by Christ in doing the will of God? Connecting the dots to last episode, I shared that according to St. Bede, when Raphael said, and I quote, Take courage. God's healing is near, so take courage. That's from Tobit chapter 5, verse 10. Now, this points to Jesus in Matthew chapter 4, verse 17, when he proclaims, Do penance, for the kingdom of heaven is close at hand. Now, both the Son of God and the angel are the messengers of the Father's will. This is another allegory from Tobit. St. Bede is highlighting for us. Moreover, Bede expresses the kinship between Jews and Gentiles in salvation history in the peculiar way that he allegorizes the relation between Tobit and Gabael, to whom Tobit loaned some money and from whom he now seeks the money back. Now, Bede understands the money that Tobit loans to Gabael as an allegory of Scripture in its literal aspect. It was the literal sense of Scripture which the Jews loaned, as it were, to the Gentiles when the Hebrew Bible was made available to Gentiles in the Greek translation now known as the Septuagint. Let me pause here. How do we know that Tobit has loaned money to Gabriel? Well, in the NAB version, which is translated from the Septuagint or the Greek translation, it is not very clear. But in the Dewey Reims Bible, translated from the Latin Vulgate, the loan is explicitly expressed as a promissory note of some sort. Let me share that with you. And I quote from Tobit 5, verse 3, from the Dewey Reims Bible. And I quote, Then his father answered him and said, I have a note of his hand with me, which when thou shalt show him, he will presently pay it. Unquote. By contrast, B understands the money that Gabriel pays back to Tobit as the spiritual understanding of Scripture which Christ has made possible. It is this spiritual understanding of Scripture that will be returned to the Jews by the Gentiles when the Jews at last are gathered into Christ's church at the end of the age. Since Christ's church on earth points to the heavenly Jerusalem, which is our new promised land, I would propose that this is the anagogical sense of Scripture. Feel free to drop me a note and let me know what you think. Wow, that is so good. I am completely blown away by St. Bede the Venerable. Indeed, I do feel like getting a more profound understanding of the book of Tobit by examining its significance in Christ. As the saying from St. Augustine goes, the new is hidden in the old and the old is revealed in the new. Indeed, sacred scripture is all about the revelation of Christ by God to us. Can you appreciate the saying of St. Jerome that ignorance of Scripture is ignorance of Christ? I most certainly can. Now, some teachings in the Bibles are hard, while others are easier to relate to. Not all parables are easy to understand as well. 
And that's why it is important to read from well-recognized scholars and teachers, the fathers and doctors of the church, for example. I mean, their insights and perceptions are simply mind-blowing. So I just talked about the allegorical sense of the book of Tobit. There is more. There is the moral senses as well. We see that um, in the early chapters, the moral works of mercy from Tobit, his feeding the poor, clothing the naked, burying the dead, etc. And Tobit passing down God's ways to Tobiah in the early chapters. All these would certainly fall into the moral sense of scripture or instructions for us to follow. Implicitly, we can also find the anagogical sense pointing to our destiny in the heavenly Jerusalem. Can you see how rich the Bible is? While I can read the scripture for you, unfortunately, I cannot do the reading for you. I can share my findings and my reflection with you, but I cannot do the reflection for you. This is where you need to come in and put in some time and effort to appreciate, wow, this is truly the word of God and to really get to know Christ. Next, I will try to unpack predestination, soulmate, marriage, and spirituality from chapter 6. Now, these are big topics in and by themselves. Let's see if we can connect the dots. From verse 12 in chapter 6, it reads, You more than other have the right to marry her. And verse 18 which reads, Do not be afraid, for she was set apart for you before the world existed. Spoiler alert, notwithstanding, the marriage of Tobiah and Sarah is divinely predestined. In a sense, Tobiah and Sarah are soulmates. But before the marriage can take place, the demon must first be driven out from Sarah. And before they can consummate the marriage, both of them must get up to pray. And that's from verse 18 in chapter 6. And as I stated at the top of the podcast, what's up with that? Well, let's unpack predestination and soulmate first since they are related. On predestination, I refer to paragraph 600 from the CCC, which states, and I quote, To God, all moments of time are present in their immediacy. When, therefore, he establishes his eternal plan of predestination, he includes in it each person's free response to his grace. Unquote. So first, paragraph 600 states that God is not limited to the dimension of time and space as we know it. And as it is written by the prophet Isaiah, his thoughts are not our thoughts, his ways are certainly not our ways. To paraphrase predestination. This doctrine says that God has a plan for each and every one of us who is open to such a possibility and is willing to accept it. This divine plan was not something God made up as he went along, but as seen from Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 5, it reads, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you came to birth, I consecrated you. I appointed you as prophet to the nations. And in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world to be holy and without blemish before him in love. Unquote. This destiny was set before we were formed in our mother's womb. In fact, even before the world was formed. How cool is that? I know. I need to work on my vocabulary, but wow, how cool is that? So, connecting the dots to verse 16 where Raphael tells Tobiah, and I quote, I know tonight she will be given to you as your wife, unquote. And verse 18, that Sarah, and I quote, was indeed set apart for you before the world existed, unquote. Indeed, from these verses, we can see that Tobiah and Sarah are soulmates, divinely predestined. What about our marriage? Is our marriage divinely predestined as well? Scripture teaches us that the origin of the first marriage on earth, Adam and Eve, represents God's gift to us. The destiny of the family, however, depends on how seriously we take our task of supplying the necessary few to make it fly. 
And that's where our free will and our cooperation come in. Accompanied by a strong religious life, families will soar and nothing will be able to break them. So when viewed in that lens, a soulmate is one who helps his or her partner to have a Christ-centered life, a building block for their family life, to help each other to work out their respective imperfections because we are all imperfect, to walk with Christ and ultimately to be perfected in love. That would be my definition of a soulmate, as opposed to the secular misconceived notion of the perfect one. Next, marriage and spirituality. What is the connection? Well, let me start by quoting Pope Francis from his Amoris Laetitia, The Joy of Love, number 371, 371, and it reads, If a family is centered on Christ, He will unify and illumine or brighten its entire life. Moments of pain and difficulty will be experienced in union with the Lord's cross, and His closeness will make it possible to surmount them. In the darkest hours of a family's life, union with Jesus in His abandonment can help avoid a breakup. Unquote. That is the importance of having a family life centered on Christ. And I continue, gradually, with the grace of the Holy Spirit, the spouses grow in holiness through married life, also by sharing in the mystery of the Christ's cross, which transforms difficulties and sufferings into an offering of love. This is where the spirituality of marriage kicks in. It is a journey, not a sprint. The Lord is our shepherd. Christ knows our suffering and our pain. Despite being abandoned by his people on the cross, he remains faithful to his people, just as the covenant of Christ and his church in the wedding feast of the Lamb is unbreakable. The union of man and woman created in the image and likeness of God is also an unbreakable union. Recall that when Jesus began his public ministry, he performed his very first sign at the wedding in Cana, signifying his presence in our wedding in our lives. In my mind, that is the mystery of marriage and spirituality and the vital link between them. Don't take my word for it. Let's look at CCC number 1602. 1602 to better understand what marriage in God's plan is. And I quote, Sacred scripture begins with the creation of man and woman in the image and likeness of God and concludes with a vision of the wedding feast of the Lamb. Scripture speaks throughout of marriage and its mystery, its institution and the meaning God has given it, its origin and its end, its various realizations throughout the history of salvation, the difficulties arising from sin and its renewal in the Lord and the new covenant of Christ and the church. Unquote. I know that's a mouthful, but let's unpack that. Marriage is a mystery, we know that, and a pretty major theme in the Bible. From the first marriage of Adam and Eve in the book of Genesis, to the wedding feast of the Lamb in the book of Revelation. And in between the first and the last books in the Bible, the salvation history records difficulties of marriage arising from sin. Now, we know that sin leads to death, and we are all sinners. So, we need to repent and work on our renewal in the Lord, in the new covenant of Christ and His church, with Christ, the bridegroom, and the church, His bride. And I continue to paragraph 1604 of the CCC, and it reads, God, who created man out of love, also calls him to love the fundamental and innate vocation of every human being. For man is created in the image and likeness of God, who is himself love. Since God created him, man, 
and woman, their mutual love becomes an image of the absolute and unfailing love with which God loves men. Unquote. Now that is God's plan of marriage for us. To love one another as I have loved you. Christ's love for man is sacrificial love, and the new covenant of Christ and the church, which is his bride, is an everlasting covenant and unbreakable union. Continuing to the next paragraph, 1605, it reads, Holy Scripture affirms that man and woman were created for one another. It is not good that man should be alone. The woman, flesh of his flesh, is equal, is nearest in all things, is given to him by God as a helpmate. She thus represents God from whom comes our help. Therefore, a man leaves his father and his mother and cleaves to his wife, and they become one flesh. The Lord himself shows that this signifies an unbreakable union of their two lives by recalling what the plan of the Creator had been in the beginning. So, they are no longer two, but one flesh. Unquote. Now, that is all good when the family is centered on Christ. But where difficulties arise is when marriage is ruled under the regime of sin. For more on that, let's turn to paragraph 1606 of the CCC, which reads, Every man experiences evil around him and within himself. This experience makes itself felt in the relationships between men and women. Their union has always been threatened by discord, a spirit of domination, infidelity, jealousy, and conflicts that can escalate into hatred and separation. Unquote. And continuing to the next paragraph, 1607, and I read, According to faith, this disorder we notice so painfully does not stem from the nature of man and woman, nor from the nature of their relations, but from sin. As a break with God, the first sin had for its first consequence the rupture of the original communion between men and woman. These relations were distorted by mutual recriminations, their mutual attraction, the Creator's own gift, changed into a relationship of domination and lust. End of quote. Let's unpack that. The breakdown of marriage is not a result of anything but from sin. And the consequence of sin is the destruction of the original communion between man and woman. Their relations become distorted by retaliatory accusations, pointing fingers at one another. The mutual attraction turned into domination and lust. Recall that when God questioned Adam why he ate the forbidden fruit, what did Adam say? Well, it is Eve who gave it to him. In any case, this is precisely what happened to the seven men Sarah was set to marry in the book of Tobit. The context here is that when Raphael suggested that Tobiah should take Sarah as his wife, Tobiah was not keen initially, citing the news that, you know, the seven suitors of Sarah have died before a demon who is in love with her. And here's the narrative from the Dewey Reims Bible, and I quote from verse 16 to verse 18. Then the angel Raphael said to him, Hear me and I will show thee who they are over whom the devil can prevail. For they who in such manner receive matrimony as to shut out God from themselves and from their mind and to give themselves to their lust as the horse and mule which have not understanding over them the devil have power. But thou, when thou shalt take her, go into the chamber and for three days Keep thyself continent from her, and give thyself to nothing else but to prayers with her. Unquote. We see that um, the Dewey Weems Bible is translated into ancient English, so I'm just reading it word for word. But we can see that the DRB, 
translated from the Latin Vulgate, provides a bit more details than the Greek Bible, which is based on the Septuagint. In particular, Raphael revealed that all the seven men died because they have shut out God from themselves and from their minds, and to give themselves to their lust, just like wild animals, and therefore the devil has power over them. In my mind, allegorically, when you reject the love of God and succumb to the love of self, you are committing sin and the devil has power over you. The consequence of sin is death. And this explains the death of the seven suitors of Sarah perfectly. And it is also consistent with paragraph 1607 from the CCC, which we just heard that sin is the cause and the breakdown of a marriage in God's plan. And just as Christ has conquered death and was resurrected in three days, I think it is no coincidence that Raphael instructed Tobiah to pray with Sarah for three days, right? In our baptism, when we accept Christ in our heart, in our mind, and in our might, we renounce the devil and we are dead to our sin. Incorporated into Christ, we then rise with the resurrected Christ on the third day to life. To overcome our sin, I think we should pray every day, period. In summary, the different senses in reading scripture provide a richer meaning of the word of God. Quoting CCC paragraph 118, the letter speaks of deeds, allegory to faith, the moral, how to act, and a goji, our destiny. Predestination is a doctrine that says God has a plan for each and every one of us who is open to such a possibility and who is willing to accept it. From scripture, a soulmate is one predestined to help his or her partner to have a Christ-centered life, a building block essential for a healthy family life, helping each other to work out their respective imperfections, walking with Christ together, and ultimately being perfected in love. After all, the woman, flesh of his flesh, his equal, his nearest in all things, is given to him by God as a helpmate. She thus represents God from whom comes our help. Marriage and Spirituality Just as the union of Christ and the church, his bride, is unbreakable, and since we are created in the image and likeness of God, so too the sacred union of men and his spouse is unbreakable. What God has joined together, no human being must separate. That's from Matthew chapter 19, verse 6. To the extent that the breakdown of marriages is brought about from sin, we need the grace of God to help us overcome our sin. We need the presence of God in our life, for without God, we can do nothing. We also need to cooperate fully with the divine help given to us, just like Tobiah. Now, marriage is not about self-fulfillment or self-satisfaction. But if we can learn anything from Christ, it is about self-giving, self-donation. In closing, let me share the wisdom of Pope Francis in his Amoris Laetitia with you. Marriage is the icon of God's love for us. God desires that each of us grow in holiness by giving and receiving love like Him. Such love requires putting the human ego aside and first considering the needs of others before our own. As we pray in the peace prayer of St. Francis of Assisi, it is giving that we receive. We can only know our real selves when we give ourselves to others. Marriage is also the experience of belonging completely to another person. Spouses accept the challenge and aspiration of supporting one another, growing old together, and, in this way, reflecting God's own faithfulness. Look, I am with you always to the end of time.
And that's from Matthew chapter 28, verse 20. The very last verse in the very last chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. Now, let us pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear Father, thank you for the gift of my soulmate, one who is predestined to help me to be a better person through the sanctity of our holy matrimony, so as to bear witness to Christ's union with his church. But we cannot do it without your grace. Do not forsaken us, for we are weak and unworthy. But guide us and lead us to the straight path back to you when we fall astray so that we may remain in you and for you. In Jesus' name we pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you for listening to the Setting Apart podcast. If you like what you hear, please subscribe and get notified so you won't miss any episode. And please feel free to give me your ratings and reviews so that others may get to listen as well. Thank you and God bless.